1988, Yellowstone National Park awoke as if from a hundred years sleep and exploded in flames. Each year in the United States, fire consumes millions of acres of brush and forest. Wildfire can seem a terrible scourge, but in nature, it's an event to which many ecosystems have adapted and some even depend upon for survival. Can we live with nature's fire? I'm James Woods. Fire evokes many contradictory images and emotions. There's the campfire or the family hearth, symbols of intimacy and warmth. Then there's fire gone wild, destroying forests and ripping through communities, spreading terror. Like a tornado or an earthquake, the unshackled power of a forest fire is awesome and fearful, and we fight it as we would an invading enemy. But as violent as fire can be, it's also a rejuvenating force in many ecosystems, something we should allow, even encourage. Whether ignited by lightning or a careless match, wildfire forces us to decide, to let it burn and risk losing control, or to try and put it out. In some years, it seems nothing can stop the flames. 1988. Drought set the stage for one of the worst fire years on record. The fires roared through more than five million acres in the western United States. But it was the inferno at Yellowstone, the world's first national park, that horrified the nation. Twenty-five thousand firefighters moved in with fire hoses and hand tools. Nearly a hundred specially equipped helicopters and airplanes backed them up with an unprecedented aerial attack. The cost rose over a hundred million dollars, the largest and most expensive firefight in history. By the time the smoke cleared, the Yellowstone fires had touched off a bitter argument over fire policy and raised new questions about the management of wilderness in America. In reality, fire in many western mountain areas is as common as the winter snow. Lightning ignites tens of thousands of blazes each year. Typically, these fires cover no more than an acre, spreading along the ground, burning small plants and dead wood. The flames rise higher if they can climb a ladder of dry brush and small trees. Smoke heats up branches and pine needles above, and when they reach a critical temperature, the tree suddenly explodes. Since 1972, Yellowstone has let most lightning fires burn, after nearly a century of putting them out. Similar natural fire policies are in effect in other national parks and wilderness areas around the country. The purpose? To let nature take its own course without interference from man. But out of about 20 lightning fires in Yellowstone each year, it's very rare that any burn more than a thousand acres. 
A short growing season and extensive mineral poor soils mean there is little of the undergrowth needed for fire to spread. The odds are against a big fire. But 1988 was a year that beat the odds. The summer began with one of the most important ingredients needed for fire, drought, among the worst in the park's history. By the time the first lightning fires ignited, the moisture in plants had fallen to dangerously low levels. Then a heat wave set in, the humidity dropped, and the wind began to blow. By the end of July, 90,000 acres burn, and the park orders all fires suppressed in accordance with its fire policy. Several human-caused fires roar out of control. The North Fork fire on the park's west side, started at a logger's camp, is fought without success from the beginning. By mid-August, the fires claim a quarter million acres. Thousands of firefighters move in to dig fire lines by hand. Bulldozers and other heavy equipment are judged to be destructive to the landscape and ineffective in the extreme fire conditions, so they are kept out, creating the impression that not enough is being done. Critics accuse park officials of fiddling while Yellowstone burns, while merchants in nearby towns complain of heavy economic losses. The fire has just literally shut the business down in Cook City, Montana. We uh, normally run full. We're running nine rooms a night. There's just no business for this time of year. Our birds are being lost. We're not having birds. They're flying away, being burned. We're losing everything. Park policy of wildfires and so on is all right on a normal year. But it's my experience, you don't mess around with Mother Nature on an abnormal year. To many, the fires are a tragedy. But to park researchers, fire is a basic part of Yellowstone's history. They've seen many small blazes. This is a rare chance to study a large fire with ecological effects that span the entire region. If it gets across into that, I think it'll come on up. Sure, you've got slope to feed it, it'll make it up this way. If it doesn't get here today, maybe tomorrow or the day after. The North Fork fire is expected to sweep this area in a few days. These researchers want to know the composition of plants here now. Live lodgepole for a one. And they'll return in the years ahead to study the way the same plants rebuild the forest. Three. Moss for a two. Fur, lodgepole, fur, lodgepole. Then we'll put the other. Don Despain is the park's chief botanist. 80% of our fires that started from lightning go out on their own at less than an acre in size. When these dry years come by, then the fires can burn in those old growth forests. And then very, very occasionally, every two, 300, maybe 500 years, a year like 1988 will come by where it's very dry and we have fires started and then the winds come. That's the normal fire regime for the Yellowstone area. Before 1988, a third of the park consisted of old-growth forests that had not burned in 250 years or more. These forests appear as red areas on this map. Large tracts of land with trees all the same age are one indication of Yellowstone's fire cycle. Decades of small fires followed by a forest-clearing holocaust. Late in the day, all around the park, the fires begin to explode. Officials survey the fires by air to map their progress, but they are virtually powerless to stop the flames.
August 20th becomes known as Black Saturday. That day, the Yellowstone fires consume a record 150,000 acres. A fire this size acts like a giant chimney, sucking air into the flames, generating winds as high as 60 miles per hour. Thick smoke blown by the wind obscures the landscape. It's exciting to see to see uh, you know a natural sort of phenomenon going on, and clearing the forest and uh, and just uh, seeing it burn up right up to the road like that. Uh, it's it's very exciting. I don't know where it's going to end. How long it's going to take this to grow back? I've been here. This is my fourth time to Yellowstone. And it, I've never seen anything like this. The fires continue to spread in late August and early September. Before it's over, fire perimeters cover nearly half the land inside the park, with almost 60% of this area burned by human-caused fires. 5,000 Army and Marine troops are called in to relieve exhausted firefighters. Fire crews throw everything in their arsenal at the advancing flames. One technique, setting small fires to clear out fuels ahead of the main fire front, backfires in the high winds roaring out of control and threatening the town of Cook City. There are no restrictions on the use of heavy equipment outside the park so bulldozers are called in to clear out wide fuel-free zones. Ground crews experiment with explosives to clear the vegetation quickly. Fire in the hole! The fiery drama finally reaches a climax on September 7th near the historic Old Faithful Lodge. The forest on all sides is engulfed in a firestorm. It's a common misconception that large numbers of animals are displaced or killed by forest fires. Out of about 30,000 elk in the park, only 335 died, along with nine buffalo. Not from burns, but from smoke inhalation. Most large animals simply moved out of the way. Still, major tracts of Yellowstone's legendary forests seem to be reduced to wasteland. Is one of America's natural wonders lost? How long before the forests are restored? A lot of people have the idea that this would be totally destroyed for 200 years because this may have been a 200-year-old forest. In an ecological sense, 200 years is a very short time. These forests have been here for over 10,000 years, and they have burned periodically over that time, many times. And so if we look at things in the long term, uh, yes, this will be a beautiful place again in 200 years. But even in our own time scale, uh, if you were to come back here in three years, the ground would be totally covered with green vegetation and different colored flowers. and. Uh, 
It would be a different scene than, than what was here before the fire, but it would still be a good, active biological community uh, that would, had, would have its own beauty that would be different than the beauty before. That's already happening. Within weeks, an underground world of seeds and roots begins to come to life. The lodgepole pine forests that dominate the park set the stage for their own recovery. The heat from fire opens many of their cones, and in some areas they have spilled up to a million seeds per acre. The Yellowstone fires captured the nation's attention like few have in the past. Wilderness is part of our heritage, but the fires that sweep through them seem only threatening and destructive. It was not always so. At one time, humans used fire as a basic tool to shape the natural environment. Native Americans burned extensively to promote new plant growth for game animals, to beat back the forest, or drive out their enemies. These practices were also adopted by European settlers. In the late 19th century, the movement to preserve natural areas brought a new view of fire. Conservationists saw it as an alien force spread by man that prevented forests from reaching what was thought to be their biological destiny. In this view, Yellowstone's forests progressed through a series of predetermined stages, beginning with young lodgepole pine trees. Over time, as the lodgepoles age and begin to fall, spruce and fir trees take root. At the final or climax stage, mature spruce and fir shade out the lodgepole, becoming a stable forest that would last centuries or more. It was thought that before European man arrived, these ancient climax forests spread out endlessly on the North American continent. At the beginning of the 20th century, fire seemed to threaten this American legacy, along with valuable timber industries. The nation's forests had to be protected. But fire seemed to take a greater toll in acreage and human life with each passing year. Whole towns burned. Then, in 1910, fires unlike any in memory ripped through northern sections of the country. More than five million acres of forest went up in flames, three million in Idaho and Montana. Next year, Congress gave the Forest Service a mandate to create a national firefighting infrastructure. In the 1930s, a huge reservoir of youth employed by the government made possible an ambitious new goal, to stomp out all fires by 10 a.m. the day after they started. This single standard defined American firefighting for almost 50 years. But this would always be a losing battle as long as Americans were careless. So the Forest Service took its war on fire to another front, public relations. In this poster, Uncle Sam left no doubt who was to blame for forest fires. It's your forest, it's your fault. The stakes seemed to rise during World War II. One careless match could help the enemy win. Then came Smokey the Bear, one of the most successful symbols of modern times. The presentation was softer, but the message of wartime emergency was the same. World War II is very much a fire war in ways that earlier wars in the century had not been. So we discovered napalm, flamethrowers, incendiary bombs, and the atomic bomb uh, sort of ends it uh, with a great fire image. Uh, and the alarm grows that the next war is going to be a fire war and the civilian population has to be protected. So all of that comes to bear. But the other thing that occurs, uh, I think is extremely important, is that Walt Disney Studios releases Bambi in the midst of the war, uh, 1942. And it was 
very t much targeted towards kids, and there are two images that stay with kids, I think, as a result of it. One is, is the murder of Bambi's uh, mother. A uh, very powerful uh, nerve touched in kids. And the other is that the same group who kills Bambi's mother is responsible for a forest fire that threatens Bambi and his father. And I don't want to go sort of psych psychological on you, but the sense, I think they're very powerful associations and images that fire was bad. And we've got in the post-war era, uh, the whole baby boom, a very child-centered culture and so forth. And so Smokey the Bear uh, is able to sort of ride that crest. And we have a kind of Cold War on fire and I think a very child-centered uh, prevention campaign, which then gets enlarged uh, and grows out of that. This campaign got a boost in 1951 when a real live Smokey came to light. It lived like any bear in a New Mexico forest. A growling and a prowling and a scratching. That's right, that bear cub didn't have a care in the world. Then somebody, a two-legged somebody, got careless. Little Smokey survived the fire. Luckily, he was rescued and taken to the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., where he became a living symbol of fire prevention. I hate forest fires worse than all the diamondback rattlesnakes in the world. That's why I've tried to do my little bit toward preventing them. The hot war against fire grew hotter in an age of new technology. In the 1950s, researchers developed new chemicals to put fires out. They studied fire itself, focusing on the mass fires that might occur during nuclear war. On the fire lines, firefighters put modern bulldozers to work carving up fire breaks. In more rugged terrain, they turned to a potent new weapon, aircraft that could dump chemicals and water directly on the flames. Aircraft transported elite paratroop squads trained to stop backcountry fires before they spread. But the wartime urgency gradually faded, and the 10 a.m. policy was finally abandoned in 1978. Officials learned that fighting the small fires often allowed dead wood to build up, eventually causing even larger fires. In a basic change in policy, they began to first survey wilderness fires and attack only if property or resources were threatened. These new tactics went hand in hand with a new age of wilderness management. Scientists began to study fire, not as an enemy, but as a natural process. They learned that fire and life shared an intimate history, beginning hundreds of millions of years ago when marine organisms released oxygen into the atmosphere, allowing terrestrial life to evolve. This new atmosphere supported fire, and plants provided the fuel. Fire is part of an ancient cycle of death and rebirth. In dry, temperate zones where decomposition is slow, fire quickly breaks down nutrients stored in plants and returns them to the soil where they become available for new plant growth. Fire has exerted a powerful evolutionary force on plants. And together with climate and soil in areas like the Northern Rockies, it accounts for a complex mosaic of different aged trees, of meadows, and forest edge. Fire is essential to the survival of some ecosystems, in this case, the prairies of South Dakota. Lightning is thought to have once set these grasslands on fire about every 12 years. Flames are carried by the wind through a layer of dead and matted grasses. 
sweeping across the land, the fire clears out trees that gain a foothold on the prairie. The fire moves from the prairie flatlands into a ravine. Rising heat further up the hill draws air into the flames near the bottom, and the ravine channels the flow, creating an inferno. The fire encounters two ponderosa pine trees that have invaded from the high country of the Black Hills. The ponderosa pine is adapted to grass fires this size. Thick, fire-resistant bark at its base can withstand the flames, protecting the tree's vital inner core. The first tree survives the assault, and the flames move on to the second. Whether because the second tree is weaker, or the fuel bed of grasses and pine needles at its base more dense, the fire girdles its trunk, killing it. The flames leave behind them blackened earth and dried, smoldering buffalo dung. The fire barely interrupts the daily habits of prairie animals. Buffalo continue to travel along the same well-worn paths. They'll graze on the unburned patches of grass within the fire perimeter, or they'll walk outside. Sharp-tailed grouse come back to their dancing grounds to resume mating rituals. Fire on the South Dakota prairie maintains a grassland ecosystem, and without it, trees would eventually take over much of the land. The forest of the longleaf pine in the southeastern United States is another ecosystem that depends on fire. Before man began putting it out, fire was a presence to which all plants and animals adapted or perished. For the gopher tortoise, which lives exclusively beneath the longleaf, fire clears out grasses and shrubs, making way for the succulent regrowth of plants that make up its food base. The gopher tortoise makes it possible for a variety of mice, insects, and reptiles to live here by digging what amount to community fire shelters, its nesting holes. The longleaf pine has evolved a highly elaborate strategy to survive fire. For two to seven years, longleaf seedlings remain virtually indistinguishable from grasses that mat the forest floor. The seedling grows only an inch or two above ground, its vital growth part staying below the heat of fire, while it sends a taproot several feet down to store up the energy needed to shoot quickly above the flames when it finally grows.
The southeastern United States has one of the highest rates of lightning strikes on Earth, at one time igniting these longleaf forests about every three years. Under these natural conditions, fire keeps the understory low so the flames rarely grow hot enough to threaten the trees. Yet the flames are kept alive by fallen pine needles and wire grass, a bunch grass that almost always grows beneath the longleaf. The longleaf pine and wire grass depend on fire. Together they maintain a fiery conspiracy, promoting the spread of fire to prune back their competitors, oak and other hardwood trees that would eventually take over the forest if not burned off. Adult longleaf trees easily withstand these low-level flames with thick bark at their bases and their more vulnerable branches high above the forest floor. The young trees, now in the early growth phase, may not survive. Their needles provide some protection by shielding the growth bud at the center of the plant. The bud itself is wrapped in a sheath of younger needles, which have a high moisture content. If the flames stay low, these needles are enough to save the plant. Within just a few years, young longleaf trees have grown above the flames, and their most sensitive and flammable tissues are out of danger. As long as fire returns often enough, killing off the hardwood trees, the longleaf pine will continue to reproduce and dominate the forest. The study of fire-dependent species such as the longleaf pine strengthened the rationale for tolerating fire in natural areas. What we have never accepted are the large-scale fires that continue to erupt in wilderness areas, especially in the West. And that's because scenes like this one in Southern California have become more and more frequent. Houses are being built increasingly on the doorstep of fire's domain. That domain is Chaparral a dense complex of shrubs and trees that covers steep mountainsides throughout Southern California. These plants are vital to communities in Los Angeles because they keep erosion in check and provide extensive watersheds. They also form one of the most fire-prone ecosystems on Earth. Before humans arrived, chaparral fires were probably rare because of infrequent lightning. Today, the region is being swept by an unprecedented wave of arson and accidental fires, while the natural fire regime is but a distant memory, lost in a smoky haze. Chaparral fires are fed by dry desert winds, the famed Santa Anas, sometimes known as devil winds. Among the most vicious fires on earth, they have long inspired images of hell, of a world ending holocaust. fire is put out by rain, and a rattlesnake emerges to search the charred landscape for prey. Nearby elite crews known as hotshots move in along the fire front to search for burning embers that could feed another eruption. The crew scatters the embers by hand, 
but that may not be enough. They clear away dense chaparral nearby that could turn into an explosive fuel source if the weather heats up again. Chaparral fires are a major public safety problem, so government agencies in Southern California spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year to control them, often with limited success. These days, helicopters are not only dropping water, they're dropping fire itself. Drawing on techniques long used in the southeast, firefighters in Los Angeles County and surrounding national forests have been setting low-intensity prescribed fires to clear flammable brush. But as more and more houses are being built in these fire-prone areas, the fire conditions appear to be getting worse. Today, entire hillsides throughout Southern California are covered with gray, dead chaparral, cyanothus plants weakened by drought and killed off by a fungus. This is the live cyanothus. The vegetation is, is very crisp. The, the leaves are curled on the edges. This is actually sick looking brush. This is the dieback that's, that's taken place recently. You can see that the foliage has died. It's very dry fine material that'll burn readily. The cenothus often is a plant that is difficult to burn under a lot of circumstances. Now we expect it's really gonna propagate the fire. It's gonna help it spread up the hillsides rapidly. A hillside like that right below us, we might see a fire under these conditions with no wind, moving 100 yards in less than a minute. If we get wind on it, we'll see firebrands that be blown off into the neighboring city and we'll see a lot of structures lost. The dieback of cyanothus plants is due mainly to drought there are also signs that we may have contributed to it. The dieback may also be related to air pollution. It turns out here, right in the San Gabriels, the dieback is the worst, and it seems to be worst right about 3,500 foot elevation, which is sort of the bathtub ring from the air pollution that comes out of the basin. In fact, we have what's a national record for uh, atmospheric deposition of nitrate sulfates in the vegetation here. Science has shown that fire is important to the survival of many ecosystems. But in many areas, the historic patterns of fire have been changed by human influences, the presence of roads or communities in wildlands, the effects of frequent human fires in some areas, and decades of fire suppression in others, complicating the decision to put it out or let it burn. What has happened in the, the last 20 years as we've tried to manage fire in wilderness is a, is a redefinition that has not only involved politics uh, and scientific knowledge, but also an ethical component. How do we relate to nature? Uh, and what is good and bad about our behavior to nature and what is good and bad in, in nature? And we've gotten into a terribly complicated situation uh, for, for people managing fire. So uh, for a while, it seemed that all fires uh, were bad and it was good to put them out. But we've gotten into a situation where uh, you know, there's a kind of smoking existentialism at the, at the end of our shovels, that some fires are good, some are bad. Uh, some fires are good but become bad in certain circumstances. There are bad fires that move into another area and maybe reclassified as good. Uh, there are prescribed fires that get out of control and do damage. Uh, there are wildfires uh, that we put out uh, and probably should, should leave to burn. Yellowstone, only months after the fires are out. Winter transforms the landscape, while a debate over the park's natural fire policy begins to take shape. Fire and drought have drastically reduced the food supply for buffalo and elk. Like an aftershock, heavy snow covers what little is left, and the animals must dig deep to find it. The scarcity of food pushes many animals into thermal areas where patches of vegetation are exposed. Others turn to whatever they can find, branches of fallen trees or tree bark.
Elk and buffalo populations are swollen from seven years of mild winters. Many of the animals migrate to lower elevations outside the park in search of food, bringing them into conflict with ranchers. As many as 5,000 elk in the park's northern herd fall to starvation. Winter becomes the most effective predator for large grazing animals. Older and weaker individuals are culled from the herds, probably making populations healthier as a whole. The carcasses are a boon to scavengers, if they find them before new snows cover them up. Spring finally brings a chance for the park to spread more positive news about the fires. Ash has fertilized the ground, and hillsides are covered with pine grass, asters, and a spectacular bloom of wildflowers. Lodgepole seedlings now dot the forest floor, varying from a few dozen per acre to more than 12,000. It's clear that Yellowstone is not destroyed, but millions who cherished its lush forests fear the park will never be the same. We've conditioned the, the public, we meaning our society, by an absolute uh, plethora, an explosion of, of uh, coffee table books where uh, everything is lovely and everything is organized and there's no chaos and uh, so on. And uh, that simply isn't the way the real world works. That's not the way the natural world is. Uh, we don't show uh, the little elk in the, in the spring, uh, the calves being crunched by grizzly bears. Uh, we show them out there with their mothers and they're happy and everything is wonderful. We show the forest is all green. I mean, we're not, this isn't a big arboretum here of some kind or another where everything is supposed to be green. And uh, we're not trying to define people's aesthetic for them. Uh, but if we have an objective of preserving naturalness, uh, then uh, oftentimes that means chaos and disruption as far as the natural world is, con is concerned. Not tranquil, not, not always necessarily pleasing to the eye. As traumatic as these fires were to communities and visitors, they were part of a necessary trade-off in wilderness today. As the natural world continues to shrink, parks such as Yellowstone must safeguard the diversity of plants and animals, along with processes such as fire that sustain them. Studies show that fire creates new opportunities for a range of plants and animals, resulting in a greater diversity of species. Fireweed may appear scarce in unburned forests, but it survives within extensive root systems that come to life when the forest is cleared by fire and the ground is flooded with nutrients, moisture, and sunlight. Fireweed becomes the center of a thriving community of insects. Late summer, caterpillars gorge themselves on fireweed leaves. They'll spin cocoons, and within a matter of weeks emerges butterflies to migrate south for the winter. Fireweed plays host to a remarkable relationship between two very different species. Ants bring together colonies of aphids, hatch from eggs they keep in their own nests over the winter. Like humans raising cattle, the ants bring the aphids to a food source, fireweed, then feed on a sugary substance secreted by these tiny insects. Insects are vital to rebuilding the food chain. They support a variety of predators, including birds such as woodpeckers that comb fire-killed trees now infested with beetles. Fire promotes biological diversity by creating a diversity of habitats. Hillsides like this seem to go up in flames, but the fires left behind an elaborate patchwork of burned and unburned forest and an even more complex pattern of regrowth. 
the variation that we see in the different recovery rates, if you want to call them recovery, is that um, before the fire, there was a lot of differences from site to site. North-facing slopes had a lot more plant material. There were more rhizomes in the soil. South-facing slopes had less. The Douglas fir forest had more. The lodgepole pine forest had less. And then the fire itself burns across the uh, forest in different ways. So that uh, depends on the temperature and the relative humidity and the wind speed at the time the fire burns across that place. All of these things go together to make a very diverse pattern of response following the fire. Glacier lilies, glacier lilies are gone senescent now. Yeah, they have a bulb. That bulb's way down in the ground. Botanist Don Despain and Roy Rankin it's returned to areas they marked for study before they burned seeking to understand how single sites respond to the fires. They'll compare the plant communities that develop in the years ahead with what they found just before the North Fork fire swept through here. Yeah, I'm about 20 centimeters off. This is number three. Right. Rotten. Uh, let's give it a three. Okay. Bare ground then would be the other. All right, that's about all we got. Next. Okay. okay. Got fireweed at three. Wood is three. Hey, we've got an aspen seedling. Two of them in Two fact. of them. Tiny Plus. aspen seedlings like these are among Two. this team's most important findings. As trees, aspen were scarce in these forests and were declining in the park as a whole. Despain has studied hundreds of small burns since he came to Yellowstone in the early 1970s. Now he and Rankin hope to find out if the large fires common in the park's history affect overall patterns of diversity. The 1988 fires may help less dominant species like aspen. Ground level fires may spell the end of these aspen trees, but the root system is alive and beginning to regenerate the stand. Normally, aspen trees send a chemical signal to their roots that suppresses the growth of new shoots. Stress has caused the signal to stop, and the roots respond by sending up an army of tiny new trees. Also responding to fire stress, another aspen grove produced a huge seed crop. Some of the seeds blew into this marsh, where fire burned out a deep layer of organic matter and formed a shallow lake. The seeds took root when the water evaporated. Seedlings like these could begin new aspen groves and reverse their decline around the park. It remains to be seen whether the advantage they gain from the fires will be lost to heavy browsing by moose and elk, which thrive on the young green leaves and stems. Park officials are doing what they can to change public attitudes about fire. Exhibits have been set up for tourists, and a park biologist, Gillian Bowser, is taking young people out to study the changing landscape. So somebody can be in charge of the bug box, and then those are your bug collecting devices. <laughs> okay, so you can sort of work your way up the slope. And just do, keep doing that, just turn stuff over. Do you have the thing to collect? They're looking for insects that help to rebuild the web of plant and animal life. What'd you get, Carol? I've got one. A black one. A black one? Yeah. Oh, look. Shake them a little. There it goes. Whoa. <laughs> so how quick would you guys expect this to recover now that you know a little bit about it? Is it as fast as you expected? Faster. Faster, 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 faster. right. Yeah. It only took a year and it said this burned what? Do you remember the day of this burned? September. September. Right, like September 9th. So here we are in August and we've already seen most of the insects back, a large number of insects. So we're looking at the recovery quite rapidly there, even though if you look at it, it looks pretty well devastated, but these guys got the most number of insects from our canopy burn, where you guys were out in the meadow, which we expected to be the easiest, and you got the fewest number of bugs. 
Despite the benefits, the Yellowstone fires are widely seen as a disaster to be prevented in the future. Natural fire plans around the country have been suspended while they are reviewed. Were officials in Yellowstone unprepared for the severe fire conditions that developed? Or did they wait too long before calling in firefighters? Or was the natural fire policy itself somehow to blame? In no sense of the word was the, was the policy responsible for all the fires that occurred in Yellowstone. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Uh, most of these fires uh, came in from the outside and, uh, had, and were man-caused and had nothing to do with policy. But certainly it caused a, uh, they caused a review of, of policy generally and the application of policy. And we did have coordination problems. And, uh, and we have to learn from any kind of an experience that may or may not have uh, led us astray, uh, but, but we're perceived to have. And so there's been a, a close look at the application of wildland fire policy in this country. Uh, it's underway right now. It's good. It's a positive thing. Uh, we certainly can't uh, have fires that escape uh, uh, that have been allowed to burn and uh, threaten property and life and uh, burn up uh, or potentially burn up communities. That can't happen. The Yellowstone fires occupy, I think, a very special place in the history of American fires. I've suggested that for about the last 20 years, we've been in a, dominated by a particular question, the question of wilderness fire. Uh, it really begins in, in the late 60s. And in fact, you can look at American policies towards fire in roughly 20-year cycle, and this is the last. And if that holds true, then, then around eight, 1990 or so, we, we'd be looking at a new kind of policy. In that context, I would interpret the Yellowstone fires as really closing out the era of wilderness fire, not because of negative publicity uh, or public alarm, but it was happening anyway. What's really going to drive the system next is this this ex-urban fire problem where you've got wildlands and houses and developments mixing. I don't think any of the questions that were raised in the Yellowstone fires that came out of those were new questions. They're stuff that the fire community has, has exhaustively examined for roughly 20 years. And in some ways, they're, they're insoluble. Uh, they're based on questions of values, philosophy, uh, how you perceive your relationship to nature. Uh, and, and there's no technical solution to them. What I think the Yellowstone fires do is to end that kind of philosophical discussion. That is to say, we, we can't afford more large fires like this in, this in this way. Even so, there is no turning back on the knowledge that fire plays an important role in nature. Yellowstone's natural fire policy will survive, though proposed revisions are aimed squarely at avoiding another 1988. They call for more intensive monitoring of fire conditions, earlier suppression, and greater responsiveness to surrounding communities. But if the historic pattern holds, large fires will someday return to Yellowstone. When they do, they'll bring many of the ecological changes begun in 1988 full circle. Autumn sets in, and the leaves of deciduous plants change color, including thousands of tiny aspen trees. Up on the park's rocky ridges, the annual collaboration between two species is underway. White bark pine trees occupy sites like this. And at this time of year, they attract a bird species upon which they are utterly dependent for reproduction, the Clark's nutcracker. Every fall, these birds come to the high country to pick apart thousands of white bark pine cones collecting up to 20 seeds at a time. Holding the seeds in a pouch just below their beak, they fly off to all sections of the park in search of places to hide them. They land in burned areas, or wherever the soil is exposed, and plant the seeds in places only they know for retrieval when the snow melts in spring. By leaving some seeds behind, these birds will slowly replant the 60,000 acres of white bark pine lost in the fires. 
Ironically, it will be last year's seed caches that produced the biggest wave of seedlings because the fires destroyed trees the birds use as landmarks to find them. For some time to come, the Yellowstone landscape will be living testimony to the natural role of fire in wilderness. But the fires that swept this great park in 1988 have also reminded us how far the primitive American landscape, where fire once burned freely, has slipped into the past, and how much is at stake today when fire escapes our control. When and where to let natural fires burn has always been complicated. We know that putting them out is not always the right answer. One lesson to learn is that just as we struggle to protect wilderness areas, we must also work to preserve natural processes within them, including fire. The question remains, can we learn to live with nature's fire? I'm James Woods. Thank you for joining us.